right, welcome everyone to the anti-penultimate <laughs> talk in the Chris Speaker series on privacy for the school year. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Michael Brennan, uh, having received his PhD about four months ago. Yep, about four that. months ago from Drexel University under the excellent advisory capabilities of Rachel Green Greenstaff. Uh, Michael works at Second Muse, and he'll be talking to you a lot about Second Muse, so I won't trump that. He also uh, worked for a stint at the FTC in the US, the Federal Trade Commission, and I think he'll be talking a bit about that as well. Yep. So Michael likes to uh, apply uh, his knowledge of privacy and his computer science skills to socially relevant problems, and I think that's a really interesting and exciting thing for him be doing and talking to us about. So let's welcome Michael Brennan. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I put this image up first to maybe try and set the tone a bit for, for this talk before I explain what it's all about. Um, I had <clears throat> the pleasure, the, the opportunity, a really exciting opportunity to go to um, Burma last December with a group of technologists and um, um, a delegation from the United States. And we met with, at one point in that trip, the information minister, actually was, we met with the deputy information minister for the country of Burma, and, uh, or Myanmar is it, the, 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 they call it. And we walked into the information ministry building and on, we go up the stairs and on the second floor, there's this giant mural about this big on the information ministry's wall. I can't tell you anything more about it than that. <laughs> Just that this really, it struck me, and it's an image that sticks in my mind that I think says so much about that country and where it's at and what they're doing. To illustrate a few things, uh, Yadanarpon Teleport is um, one of the uh, IT, uh, ICT providers in Burma, the internet provider to cell phone provider. Uh, Burma, up until recently and still arguably now, was under the rule of military junta. So you see all the military leaders up front. And you see clearly this swath of people who are proud, though not showing it on their face, of what they do here at the, and, and by the way, the building looks nothing like this. The building is like very different. It's, it's a bit more rundown and smaller. So uh, this just really sh struck me, uh, this image. So I thought I'd have it up here as you all walked in. I'll talk a little bit more about that trip later in the talk. Um, but first, I should probably talk about a little bit who I am. So my talk is called Catalyzing Social Change as a Privacy and Security Technologist. Who am I? Uh, well, like Ian said, my name is Michael Brennan. I work for a company called Second Muse, where I'm now a project manager and principal technologist. Um, I manage or support a variety of projects that have, to do, that have the goal of affecting positive social change through collaboration between technical and non-technical communities, um, and specifically focusing on social challenges social, positive social change challenges. And, and examples of some projects that you may or may not have heard of include Random Hacks of Kindness, the Central America Domestic Violence Hackathon, and the International Space Apps Challenge. We do a lot more than that, but those are some we'll be talking about later. I'm also a recent PhD graduate from uh, the Privacy, Security, and Automation Lab at Drexel University in Philadelphia, where my advisor was Rachel Greenstadt. And also, between 2010 and 2012, I worked as a technologist for the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection at the US Federal Trade Commission. And uh, finally, and this goes to what I was speaking about earlier, I'm on the Technical Advisory Council for Radio Free Asia's Open Technology Fund. And I'll be talking about a variety of these things in this talk. So this talk is a bit of an experimental talk. This is the first time I'm giving it. I'm excited to give it. Uh, I'm a little nervous to give it because it, it, it's, it's still shaping itself in my brain as I'm putting all this together. But one thing to know is that this is not a research talk. Um, this is an experiential talk, I guess. It's about um, the work that I've been doing over the past few years and how my research and my time as a PhD student in privacy and security has informed the work that I'm doing now. And um, this is a talk that I, I think that I knew in some sense I wanted to give when I started grad school um, a number of years ago. And because when I started grad school, I, I knew that I wanted to work more directly on the challenges that we face as a society, but I didn't know how I can do that uh, in, oops, sorry about that. I didn't know how I can do that in 
computer science necessarily. Um, I did my undergraduate work in computer vision. I really liked computer vision. I think there's a lot of really interesting challenges there. But it didn't, it didn't evoke in me what I, what I wanted to do in the world. I, because I, at the same time that I was working on computer vision problems as an undergrad, I was also you know, helping run the, the student group for Amnesty International, the university. And I thought, like, Amnesty International, human rights, computer science, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how these things cross. And it's taken me a lot of time trying to figure out how things like that cross. And I'm still figuring out how things like that cross. Um, and uh, I didn't even know how this could be a career. And I'm still trying to figure out how this could be a career. And it's taken a lot of learning, a lot of experimenting, talking, exploring, uh, to find the ways that I feel like I could best contribute. And I'm here to kind of share some of my learnings and experiences in this space in this space, in how I can affect change as a computer scientist in some really tangible ways. And um, I'm most happy to be giving this talk because I, I didn't want to give this, I, I feel like there's something presumptuous about this, and I want to maybe give some background to that, which is I have people come to me and ask me a lot about the work that I do and how I got there. So I know that there are other folks that are going through the same struggle that I've gone through and continue to go through, which is how can I apply my skills for good in this world in a specific kind of way. And um, so I hope that through sharing some of my experiences at Second Muse, at the Federal Trade Commission, at the Open Technology Fund, um, that some of you who may or may not be grappling with these same issues could maybe apply those experiences and say, oh, how can I look at it in, in, in what I do? And how can I look at uh, where I want to go? Um, so I, I, that's my goal. Whether we achieve that, we'll see. <laughs> um, but yeah. So I'm going to start talking about what I'm doing now. So right now I work for a company called Second Muse, which you've probably not heard of, and that's fine. We're a small company. We're spread around the world. There's about 16 or 17 of us at that, this point. I'm based in Philadelphia with another colleague. There's a handful of folks based in Berlin. And then everyone else is kind of just spread literally all over the world. At one, now we're focused between Australia, the US, and Europe. But at one point, we had folks in Mongolia, in China, in Central America, Canada, US. Germany, Australia, and traveling all, all, all around as well. So what does Second Muse do? Well, in a general sense, Second Muse creates positive social change um, by applying the art, of science, the art and science of collaboration to complex problems. Well, what does that mean? What's the art and science of collaboration? How do you apply it to complex problems? Well, some complex problems might be, one, engaging, um, engaging people in a city with an under, underutilized green space bringing together a collective of stakeholders that want to see that green space be utilized and a collective of stakeholders that could potentially be using that green space and coming up with a collaborative solution to address it. Um, addressing, issues of, addressing issues of domestic violence with technology, uh, especially in developing countries. Bringing together the different folks that are involved in that problem, understanding that problem, and moving forward. Um, pushing mining companies to make positive social impact and look beyond their, uh, beyond their immediate bottom line and showing them how if they do things that are good for the community and the governments that they work in, not only is it great for them, but it can help, not only is it great for those communities and governments, but can it also be good for their, their long-term bottom line. And maybe there's a mutually beneficial way that we can all create positive change in a community, even when you're dealing with something as seemingly hard to comprehend as, as the, the negative things that could come from a mining industry. Um, Examining the future of manned space flight. I mean, this is a really interesting problem that I won't go into too much, but going to an organization like NASA and realizing that an organization like NASA isn't really a monolithic agency. There's all these other sub-agencies and groups within it. And even though they share this common exciting goal around space exploration, that the people within it are not always in line. And if you can bring those different stakeholders together, if you can bring those different people together and facilitate their collaboration, you can come up with some exciting visions in ways that they never would have imagined in themselves, even though it really came out of their work. Um, so how, how do we do that? How do we tackle these problems in ways that are meaningful? What's our process here? Well, one, we deeply understand the system around a problem and the people involved in that system. Two, we develop a prototype strategic solution. We co-develop it, really, with the people that are involved in the process. Three, we implement that strategy as prototypes and pilots. And four, we turn those pilots into a program for scaled impact. We actually apply those results and see, see if they really affect in the way that the pilots show that they would affect the world. Now, writing out these things, to me at least, this sounds a, lot, a little bit like research, right? You look at a problem, you understand the constraints, you understand 
the players in that field, you look at the work that's already been done, you develop your hypothesis, you test the hypothesis, then you apply that hypothesis and that test to, to the system that you're working in and see what the results are. So when people ask me, like, where, where, why are you doing this, what you're doing now after, going through, you know, after getting a PhD in computer science, I say because what I learned as a, as a PhD student, while I learned in all my privacy and security research, it's how to tackle problems in a systematic way. And that's what I'm applying to the work that I do every day. So specifically my work, the projects that I work on, we do a lot of things that are not all really around tech, but my interest is in tech and how technology can affect change. Um, so I manage and work on a number of projects around mass collaboration, technology, and social change. And three that I want to talk about right now are the Central American Domestic Violence Hackathon, Random Hacks of Kindness, and the NASA's International Space Apps Challenge. Um, please don't take this as necessarily like everything that we could be doing in the space, but as, as examples, because they very much are. And a lot of what we do is very exploratory, kind of almost action-oriented research. We're trying to figure out if we can solve certain problems in certain ways. Central America Domestic Violence Hackathon. I had, again, the I say this a lot about the work that I do, and I feel fortunate to be able to say this. I had the pleasure of being involved in this project. So this is a project that the uh, Latin America and Caribbean organization and the World Bank came to us and said, um, for those of you who are not familiar with everything the World Bank does, the World Bank is actually a series of groups, only one of which is actually a bank that, take, that, that takes in money and makes profit. The other four entities are ones that dispense money in the name of fighting poverty around the world. How effective they are in doing that, and I mean, that's all, uh, upper debate, and there's lots of thoughts and opinions around that, but in this, well, I won't get into all that. In this case, we had a group of folks from the Latin America and Caribbean division come to us and say, we hear you guys do these things called hackathons sometimes. We want to look at innovative ways of approaching domestic violence, so we want you guys to run a hackathon for us in, around domestic violence in Central America. And we said, okay, you can't just solve domestic violence with a hackathon, of course, right? You can't just like throw a bunch of people in a room over a weekend and, and expect that they're gonna produce results that are gonna have an impact in, in the world or in the space that you're trying to look at. But let's think about this. What's the change that you're trying to affect? What's the problem? Let's understand it. And then we understood that on a broad level, domestic violence is an emerging issue in Central America. Emerging not necessarily in that it's happening more often, but certainly that it's been more visible in recent years. And um, there's a thought that maybe we can apply the hypothesis, well, maybe we can apply innovative approaches to technology and the way that we try and innovate in technology to the problem of domestic violence. So we created this program, of which a, a component of the program ended up being a hackathon, because a hackathon, for those of you who don't know, does anyone know what a hackathon is? Anyone not know what a hackathon is? Okay, a hackathon is when you get a bunch of people together and kind of code nonstop for a few days. So you, you try and rapidly iterate and develop a solution to a problem. And at the end of the hackathon, the goal is that you have some sort of prototype solution to that problem. Um, they can be good community cultural events around getting a lot of minds to focus on a problem specifically for a short period of time. They can be especially effective at gathering volunteer communities because where all of us work nine to five, Monday through Friday, maybe you want to spend the weekend donating some of your computer, your, your programming skills, your development skills to a social impact problem. So you go and join up with a hackathon for a weekend. You're given a good problem to work on. You hack out a prototype solution. You give it back to people that define the problem and said, here's a way that it might work. Why don't you go and see what can be done with it? So, First, though, we had to go in and, and investigate the challenges of domestic violence on the ground in, in, in six Central American countries and also, also in Washington, D.C. And we held workshops. We brought together communities of innovators and hackers and developers with organizations that worked in the space of domestic violence uh, in these countries. Uh, people, everyone from, from folks that work in rural areas out of unmarked offices for fear of retaliation from the work that they do in these rural communities, all the way up to you know, ministers from the highest levels of government. Brought them together, brought these technologies together, had a series of workshops to say, okay, what are the problems? Let's, we're not gonna try and solve domestic violence with technology, but what are the problems within domestic violence that you all face as organizations working in this space that could potentially be addressed by technology? And those problems were posed, and then we iterated on those problems with the technologists there, and defined a series of really interesting and compelling problems within the space of domestic violence that it could potentially be addressed. And then, uh, that was back in November of 2012, 
And we plan to have a hackathon to prototype out some of these solutions at the end of January. So in the intervening time, we worked with these groups to really suss out the, the, the use cases and the details and the constraints of these problems. And we brought these problem de definitions to these hackathons. And volunteer technologists, in some cases, new communities of volunteer technologists, for example, in um, Honduras and Nicaragua, those are the first ever social impact hackathons that were ever even held in those countries, came together, saw these well-defined problem definitions, hacked away at them for a weekend, uh, tried to develop some prototypes of the maybe eight or 10 that were worked on at a problem. At the end, you realize, hey, you know, these two or three might have some legs. And now what we're in the process of doing is working with the organizations on the ground, the developers, and now we're trying to bring in more government agencies and larger telecoms and tech agencies um, to support the development of these projects and bring them through to maturity. Now, just by, by way of example, what could one of these problems be? Well, there was an interesting problem that was defined in Guatemala, which is the country that I was responsible for as part of this project, um, where the organization said, you know, we really want to be able to reach out to women in rural communities that are experiencing violence and A, may not even know that what they're experiencing is wrong, because that's a, it's a major cultural challenge. B, even if they did know it's wrong, they don't have anyone to talk to. They can't go talk to someone, the communities are too small and, 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 and insular and might get back to their abuser. Um, they don't even know who to call if they, had, if they were able to call someone. Calling someone's even challenging because someone can hear them on the phone. So, so they said, they said, you know, this is the, from the domestic violence organization, they said, we, we just want, how about this, why don't we just get, why don't, we just, why don't we just send a text message to every single phone in the entire country that explains what domestic violence is, right? And you're like, okay, that's not quite gonna work for a variety of reasons, but you have a need here. And that need, let's work out that need with you. And that need is that you wanna reach these folks that are in these rural communities and provide them support when, when, they, when they want it. And the problem definition that ended up getting worked out was, well, in these communities, we don't have many advocates on the ground. It's even hard for those advocates to meet each other. But maybe we can create, we know that these folks have cell phones that can send text messages. They don't have smartphones. They don't have computers with internet access. But they have text message-based phones. Maybe we can create a system that allows women in these communities to text a number and be able to have a conversation through text with a supporter in an urban center or someone else, somewhere else in the country. Um, they can more easily control their, te their, their, their text message conversation. They don't have to worry about being overheard. Um, we're basing this on the assumption for the women that have their own cell phones and are not sharing a cell phone. So you start to define this problem definition. Um, but I wish to be clear, we're not defining a solution. I'm sure as I'm saying this, a bunch of you are thinking, well, what about this? What if they see the bill? And what if, what if someone texts them at the time that there are abusers around and they see that? There's all these problems, right? Sure, and these are things that need to be worked on and, and developed further. But the core problem that we got to is that we need a way, these organizations need a way to reach out to those women on the ground. Um, there's human non-tech problems around that as well. How do you get the phone number that they should call to those women? But the point is, even if you were to get to those things, there isn't the technical infrastructure to provide for this. And at the hackathon, a group of hackers developed a prototype to show that this was possible. And now that, that project is being worked on in conjunction with some telecom companies in um, Guatemala and domestic violence organizations so they can continue developing that problem. Um, so that's just an example of kind of what kind of work we do and how we can leverage communities of innovators with people working on specific problems and uh, develop some potential solutions to these problems. Uh, another project I work on on the other end of the spectrum, it's very similar though, is Random Hacks of Kindness. Uh, this is a map of uh, civic hacking communities that have worked through Random Hacks of Kindness around the world over the past three years. Um, and you can't read the text, unfortunately. Uh, but but you can see the spread of this community. Uh, and these are independently organized communities of people on the ground saying, we know that technology can solve problems that we face every day, whether there are food security problems or disaster relief problems or um, information access problems. We're gonna host events in our communities to bring innovators together to try and address these problems. And we're gonna do it in coordination with people all around the world so that we can build a global community of innovators. Now this is much more broad than domestic violence hackathon. In domestic violence hackathon, you're looking at defining a specific problem and working to address that specific problem. In this case, you're, it's much more about community building and giving people around the world, especially technical folks and developers, a clear way to leverage their skills for the challenges that their communities face. 
And this has been a really successful effort in that you can see how many events run around the world. It's every six months we have about 30 events that go on. Some of them have been doing events repeatedly for years. Um, I actually originally got involved with Second Muse by running an event in Philadelphia uh, a couple of times where we saw a few different projects that developed that, we, that were based on problems that were defined locally. Um, one of those problems, for example, people said, uh, you know, we have a homeless problem in, 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 homelessness problem in Philadelphia, and actually the shelters that work in Philadelphia don't um, have a system to coordinate with each other about how many open beds they have. So if someone goes to a shelter and that shelter is full, the only way to know if there's another shelter out there that has an open bed is to make you know, a call to every single shelter. Uh, when you can really easily envision a system that just kind of, it's not a technically challenging problem, that's got a central database that has the listing of the beds and all the shelters, and you can allow the folks that operate the shelters to send a text message or go online and send a note uh, when those beds fill up, and then people that work with homeless populations, if someone needs a bed, they can check this system and go and uh, tell, them, tell them what shelter to go to. Um, and there's been a few other problems like that that, that would come up in Philadelphia. Um, so this is another project I work on, which again is very broad in nature and about community building. Um, yeah, and actually this is a good a mission statement of Random Access Kindness, to create a self-sustaining global community of innovators building practical open technology for a better world and to ensure their work creates impact in society. Um, that's kind of the overall mission statement. You can go to rock.org and check out a little bit more about it. And then the last project I'll quickly talk about is the International Space Apps Challenge, which is kind of straddles the two. Um, so this is a project started by NASA. NASA said, wow, we have all this data. Uh, we have we some create terabytes and terabytes of data every day from our Earth-facing satellites. Can we define a whole bunch of challenges around that data, things that we'd like to see done, and have a participatory uh, engagement with, with innovators all around the world so they can participate in the challenge, they, they can help us with the challenges that we face, the basic challenges we face, and um, collaborate around developing solutions. So like an interesting one that came out of the last one, this is actually the second one we did. An interesting one that came out of the last one we did is that uh, NASA, for, for a bunch of its projects, was storing uh, information in a proprietary image format. So, you know, one of the problem definitions was, well, this isn't a proprietary image format. That's that's ridiculous. Uh, this should be in an open source format like PNG. So, can we create a project that will that will easily, you know, uh, uh, change a .vicar file, which is what the NASA was using, to a PNG file? It's like seems simple, right? But through that problem definition through some innovators around the world. That was something that actually, that's not even a prototype solution that's created at the end of the weekend. That's like an entire solution that's really easy. Um, but in other cases, prototype solutions are developed. So we're doing work in, uh, you know, I'm doing a lot of work in these spaces of global innovators and communities, but I think that going back to the Central America Domestic Violence Hackathon, which is one of the most recent ones we did, I think that gets to the heart of where you can see this work really going and where I'd like to see more of it happen. And I think where you see the research perspective come in. How can you look at not just the technical constraints of a problem, but the social constraints of a problem and the resource constraints of a problem and design a program that will lead to innovation in a specific space of, of social change? Um, I think it will, you know, it'll take some time to see how effective some of these initiatives are in the long term, but I'm quite encouraged by the short term successes we've seen in some of them. Um, so that's just a bit of what I want to talk about about Second Muse. Um, I'm going to kind of run through all these different ones and I can go back and talk about more about e each of them. But again, this is hopefully to be a kind of smattering of projects that are going on in this space. So another thing I wanted to talk about um, was my time at the uh, US Federal Trade Commission. Um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, I worked as a technologist for the Division of Identity uh, of, of Privacy and Identity Protection for about a year and a half. And um, the US Federal Trade Commission in general has the authority to regulate unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. Deception means a company makes a promise that's not delivered upon. Unfair means a company actually does demonstrable, demonstrable harm to a consumer in the United States. And potential violations of this authority that we have, or that the FTC has, uh, spur, can spur investigations. And the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection specifically looks at privacy issues in this space in the United States. States. Some recent landmark cases that you may have heard about are settlements that the FTC did with Facebook, with Google, and with Twitter all over the past couple of years. Um, for example, the Facebook one emerged from 
the changing of default privacy settings when they did their big redesign in 2009. Uh, the Google one came from uh, the Google, how many here are people, people here are familiar with what happened with Google Buzz and the privacy concerns around it? So a handful of people here. So Google Buzz was a social network that Google, that Google unveiled and um, in the process had some misleading questions, whether it's done intentionally or unintentionally, is, doesn't really matter, that uh, if people checked something believing they were acting a certain way, uh, like such as to hide their contact information and not share their, their list of contacts, they actually shared their list of contacts and made that public. Um, so that's a clear case of deception. And the FTC was able to come in and say, that's illegal. You can't do that. Uh, you're either going to settle with us or we're going to take you to court. And in this case, they settled. And what ended up happening is Google now, by, under the authority of the Federal Trade Commission, for the next 20 years, has to go biannual privacy audits uh, and submit the results of those audits to the Federal Trade Commission. And that, result, that case also imposes um, financial penalties on Google if they violate any of the, con any of the, uh, any of the um, consent agreement that they made. So anyway, just a few things to show kind of the work that we do. So what is the division of privacy and identity protection? This is kind of what, what, I, want, what I wanted to get at. It's less about what, what we've done. But. So this is the only federal authority in the United States on privacy and data security. And how big is it? Uh, it's about 25 lawyers and one technologist. Right? These are the folks that look at consumer privacy nationwide, in the, and again, in the United States. Um, now, that might not seem like a lot, and in some senses, it's not a lot. Uh, I should also note that the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection was formed in 2003, 2002, and they didn't hire the first technologist until 2009. That means for six plus years, um, they had no full-time or part-time on staff computer science technical advisor. And uh, once you, when I got there and started seeing the stuff that they were doing, it seemed, I mean, I'm sure that sounds amazing. It seemed especially amazing. Um, so anyway, before, <coughs> before I talk about what a technologist does, excuse me, some areas of interest of the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection are data security, online advertising practices, um, online tracking, location privacy, internet security, Anything in this realm, as you might imagine, you can just think like everyone, pretty much everyone, in the, in, at least in the country every day, uh, interacts with one of these topics by just browsing the web and buying things on the web and um, logging into Facebook or whatever, you, whatever you'd like to think. So the, 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 this is a pretty broad scope of work that we look at. So what did I do there? Well, my job as a technical advisor was, my job as a technologist was essentially be a technical advisor to the legal staff, of, that, of the legal staff that was there. And um, what that means is, you know, the, the lawyers, I can't say enough good things about the lawyers that work for the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection. They're brilliant people. They really, they're, it actually makes a little bit of sense about why they're able to go so long without a technologist. I don't work there anymore, by the way. There's other technologists there now. Um, because they're really, really smart people. And they understand privacy law. But they, don't always under, they didn't always understand the nuances of the technology. And that causes problems, because if you don't understand the nuances of the technology or the nuances of the, or, or the, the nuanced implications of a potential violation, you might overlook this, the severity of, of an issue. So what I was there to do was uh, you know, interact with the parties that were under investigation and try and foster a better, better technical understanding of the issues between, uh, you know, with, with the lawyers. Uh, and in part, that asterisk means um, uh, I mean, the way you can read that whole line is I was, a, I was a BS detector, right, in part. Like I would go to meetings with, I would go to meetings with folks uh, and, and a company would come to us and say, you know, we'd say, why, you know, why are you doing this thing this way? This is really not very cool. Maybe you should do it this other way. And they'd say, oh, that's overly burdensome. You're going to kill our business. That's going to take 300 man hours and 1,000 lines of code. And I'm able to turn to a lawyer and say, that's like 10 lines of code and it'll take two seconds to do. They're totally pulling your leg. Um, some of the proudest moments I had at the FTC was when I would go into a meeting with lawyers with a company, and I would ask them very straightforward questions. I was not rude or like, you know, or, or, and I double checked the lawyers to make sure I wasn't doing this. I would ask them very straightforward questions like, you know, when you decided to implement this technology, did you, did you consider the implications for, you know, the, the current user base and the, the data you had stored in your server? I don't know. And I'm asking questions that, if they answer truthfully, show how 
inept they were sometimes. Anyway, in one case, I did this and had this whole conversation, and they came back again two weeks later, and I wasn't able to go to the meeting, and I heard that they complained to the lawyers about me at the second meeting that I had and said that I asked very unfair questions and that I really, I really you know, was not, not, not respectful about, about what they were trying to do. Of course, the lawyers saw right through that and they said, no, you did a great job. That just shows how much we were able to get to them <laughs> and, what they were and, and, and what they were trying to get around. So um, I also would research potential violations and suggest investigations. Uh, I would educate the staff on current trends technologies. I would invite speakers to come and talk to the FTC. I, I would help foster a generally strong awareness of current trends in privacy technology, in privacy implementation, in privacy concerns. And I would also help construct legal documents that are technically sound. Um, like I said, the lawyers here are smart people and they're hard workers. They don't need to be technical experts. They just need access to one. And oftentimes, I would be working with some lawyers and on, on some cases. In the beginning, they'd be coming to me with all these questions. And then after a little while, they'd come to me with questions on these cases again. And I'd say, you know more about this now than I do. And you guys are really smart. I help, helped you build the framework of understanding of you know, maybe how cookies work on the internet or how tracking works across different sites and what the difference between first party and third party cookies are and, and uh, you know, how people can track you through, um, uh, through your cache or through uh, all sorts of different exploits. But now that you know that, like you guys are, you're, you're lawyers for a reason, you were hired here for a reason, you're really smart and now you know what you're doing. So a big part of my job was about building the capacity of the Federal Trade Commission, or at least that division, to be able to better address the technical challenges that they faced. Um, so yeah, in this case, each, each lawyer has a few cases, but you know, a technologist would work you know, a, a dozen plus. So why is this relevant to research? And why is it specifically relevant to privacy and security research? Well, regulators in general don't have the technical background to understand complex privacy and uh, privacy research papers. Um, they, they want to, but they don't always see the implications that can come from the conclusions in a, in a technical paper. And the bridge between um, the, the privacy and security research world and the regulators world is actually quite narrow. There's a number of folks that cross that bridge a lot. Folks like uh, Arvind Narayanan and Chris Sagoyan and Ashkan Sultani and Alessandro Quisti. I'm sure these are folks that you know have seen at various conferences. But it's really, in the end, just a handful of people. And there are thousands of us out there, us being privacy and security researchers. And that interaction between the regulatory bodies and, and this research communities are not very, are not very strong. And what I've been trying to advocate ever since I left there is pushing for researchers like ourselves to examine the implications, examine the impact that our work might have in the privacy, in the regulatory space, and explain that impact directly even in the papers that we write, in memos that we can write around the papers, when we reach out to technology, when we reach out to, to privacy regulators, or even to reach out to privacy regulators in general. Um, a story I was just telling earlier, there was, um, there was a uh, article that came out by, by a reporter named Peter Moss a number of months ago that was highly critical of the Federal Trade Commission. And in it, he brought up a number of really good points about where the Federal Trade Commission wasn't, you know, could do better, where it could have more resources. And there's no doubt about that. It would be better for the FTC to have two technologists than one technologist, uh, the Division of Privacy to have two technologists than one technologist. It would be better to have five than have two. Uh, it would be better for them to have more lawyers to tackle more cases. Um, but what, and so those are all valid points. But what frustrated me about the article is that the premise of the article was that there was this one grad student, this guy, Jonathan Meyer, who's a great researcher and has done a lot of really good work. And the premise of the article was that this grad student discovered this flaw that was allowing some companies to track people against their will. And that this person, that this student, had scooped the FTC. He had, he had beat the FTC and, and figured out this bug before the FTC got him. And look at how, how bad the FTC is that they didn't discover this first. And that's such a flawed premise, right? Like, the FTC can hire 10, 20, 50, 100 technologists, it doesn't matter. There are more of us out there. There's more of us in the privacy and security research community, right? And many of us share the same goals that the FTC has. Maybe not everyone, but many of us do. And the answer is not, well, the FTC should figure everything out first. 
The answer is that there should be a stronger bridge between the research privacy and security research communities and the FTC. And the story shouldn't have been, check out this grad student, who, grad student who scooped the FTC on this bug. The story should have been, check out this grad student who figured out this thing and told the FTC about it, and then look what the FTC did with it, right? Um, so that's, that's the case I'm trying to make. I was frustrated when that article came out because I think it, it, it took away from that case. It's trying to imply that the FTC should just know. Uh, they'll never have more people than there are grad students in privacy and security research. Um, another frustrating thing I ha that, that happened on the other side of this thing is, um, I actually have a whole talk around this that I'm not going, giving today, I'm not going, into, uh, not going into today, that explains all the things that I think, that th I think should be done. Um, but in the interest of hitting a number of topics, I'm, I'm kind of cutting that out. And I submitted a paper in that talk to a number of conferences, and I got rejected from like three of them before I able to, was able to give it at Hot Pets last year. And literally the rejections were like on, this, on, the, on a range of things. Like on one hand, I had one, one person say to me, I was advocating in this paper that uh, researchers, that the question of impact and adoption of privacy enhancing technologies um, is actually a scientific question and not like just a nice thing to have once your paper is published. That, that researching and understanding the potential impact of your work a, will also strengthen your research in the first place by examining those implications, and B, if you can get more people to adopt your privacy enhancing technologies, that indicates some form of success in terms of addressing the scientific question of use of privacy enhancing technologies. So one of the suggestions I made was, you know, students should, or researchers should, if they feel that their work is relevant to regulators, should write a non-technical memo that explains the paper and specifically explains the implications of this paper uh, and send it off to privacy regulators. And one reviewer said, uh, he said, you know, my students don't have time for this. They're too busy doing their work and they can't, they can't gather. And I want to say this, this is their work, right? You're doing privacy and security research. Not all privacy and security research, but a lot of it has direct implications for regulatory bodies. And you should be talking to those regulatory bodies about it. That's part of the science of it. I really believe that. And then, of course, I got another rejection letter that was like, that goes through those points, and he goes, aren't all these points just, just aren't they a bit obvious? I said, yes, they are obvious, but no one's doing them, so I'm, I'm trying to make that point. Uh, and then I ended up giving this talk, and it went over really well. I'm glad that I finally got to give it to a, to a big audience. And I realized, well, it confirmed my suspicions that the, the privacy and security research community maybe doesn't understand all of the constraints that go into privacy regulation and all of the things that hold back, for example, someone like the FTC in acting uh, in cases where you think they should act. I've heard a lot of frustration in the privacy and security community saying, why didn't the FTC do something about X? Why didn't they say anything about Y? And if they knew or had a better understanding or there's a better relationship there, I believe what they would be asking themselves is, how can I frame my work better so that I can give the FTC more ammunition to do the things that I think that they should be doing, right? Instead of just not understanding the complexities of their work. And I'm not taking blame off the FTC. I think there's a lot of political and bureaucratic challenges within uh, an institution like the FTC that prevents them from doing things that we think are valuable. But they're not all. Many of them are technical challenges. Many of them are research challenges that if you can give them the right ammunition, if you can understand the scope of the problem, if you can understand the framework in which they exist, um, your work can have some profound impact in, in what they do. I just talked a lot about that. I think you can tell that this isn't the first time I've given this talk because I'm talking a lot without going through the slides that talk about the things that I do. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll recap my FTC work just talking about this. Um, I think that anyone here that's a privacy and security researcher and doing work in this space, um, it's good to have an understanding of what the current trends are in the regulatory world. You can follow that by doing something as simple as looking at the recent communications from a body like the FTC. I don't know how the, how the privacy uh, regulatory bodies in Canada express these things, and I apologize for this being US centric. It's just <laughs> a constraint of my experience. Um, but I do think that this can be helpful in some cases. Writing an accompanying memo to your research uh, containing, one, an understanding of the current trends within a target agency, two, an understanding of the basic legal theories of the target agency, and a focus on the target audience of that agency. And that last piece is important. For the FTC, for example, the question is always, you want to always answer the question, why does this matter to my parents, not why does this matter to a computer scientist? And it might seem like a silly thing to, to explain or to have to say, but it's really important, and that's something that would come up again and again. Sometimes I would even invite in speakers, and they were trying to explain the implications of their work to, to as if they were talking to a computer science audience. And I learned that 
as I worked at the FTC more, that it was actually beneficial for me to talk through with an invited speaker to explain the kind of audience you're talking to. Because the FTC, in the end, when they're acting, when they're putting out this work, they're not, I mean, there aren't computer scientists at the top of the FTC in the, at the commissioner level. There aren't generally a lot of computer scientists reading all the output of this thing. Their goal is your average American uh, consumer who maybe doesn't have a deep, deep technical understanding of privacy regulation or privacy challenges. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll leave that for now. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, another thing that I'm involved with, with, which is the Radio Free Asia Open Technology Fund. Um, so the Open Technology Fund uses public funds to support internet freedom projects, and specifically internet freedom projects that develop open and accessible technologies supporting human rights and fostering open societies, and promote inclusive and safe access to global communication networks. Now, my role in this is as a member of the Technical Advisory Council. And as a member of the Technical Advisory Council, I review grant applications that come in and recommend projects that have been submitted for funding. And I get to participate, participate in uh, open tech fund initiatives uh, such as retreats and uh, research trips. So just real quick, I want to show you, because they just finished this and made a cool video about it. And what just happened? Um, this is a quick little minute and a half video that's it's a bit uh, Bit propaganda, but I think it tells you kind of like what their thinking is, and I just think it's I think it's neat. So we'll we'll play it, see if this works. It started with silencing speech. Then they banned books, burned libraries, jailed poems. As each new method of communication emerged, those in power have sought to censor, disrupt, and monitor free speech. The internet and its open forum for ideas is today's front line. As the rise of online technology and social media creates new opportunities for free speech, over 60 countries still find ways to censor each new online media. The internet reaches every continent and every hemisphere, and citizens around the world are being tortured, imprisoned, and even killed for their online speech. We believe that freedom of expression is a basic human right, and it needs digital freedom fighters. We are the Open Technology Fund supporting research, analysis, development, and deployment of tools and information that protect free speech. Tools that are available to anyone affected by censorship, interference, and illegitimate surveillance. The internet has the power to be our library, our meeting hall, our town square, and our megaphone, where everyone has a voice. And while freedom of expression has always been under attack, with your help and support, we will never be silenced. Join us. Follow and contribute to our carbon projects. You can help make the internet safe and open to all. Oops. <clears throat> so I think that's just a cool video showing. Uh, I mean, when I was talking about communicating to the masses what the what the part purposes of initiatives like this are, I think it's mediums like that that can be that can be particularly helpful. So, um, what are some example projects that the Open Technology Fund funds? Um, who here has heard of at least one of the projects on this list? Most of you, great. Okay, so these are all projects that they actually fund about a dozen right now. So this is just a, some that I picked out. Uh, these are a series of projects that the Open Technology Fund supports. So the Commotion Wireless Project is something put together by the New America Foundation to see if they can emulate certain com certain types of cell phone hardware and a software uh, do software emulation of certain types of cell phone network hardware, and then allow people to deploy. Um, mesh networks which would enable people to create communication networks without relying on the authority of a government, especially, you know, this is particularly relevant in places like uh, Egypt in the recent Arab, Arab Spring uprisings where they were able to shut down the internet. Imagine you're able to set up a quick, inexpensive, excuse me, mesh network to allow activists to communicate with each other uh, in a city center. <clears throat> um, Global Leaks. Global Leaks is the first open source whistleblowing framework. Um, it allows anyone to easily set up and maintain a whistleblowing platform. This is a really interesting one. Global Leaks, I thought, would be kind of a, a politically challenging one for. Uh, so, uh, the Open Technology Fund uh, gets its funds from the U.S. government, right? It goes through Congress, goes to the broad, broad, Broadcasting Board of Governors, goes to Radio Free Asia, and then goes to the Open Technology Fund. So, I kind of thought the U.S. government funding. Uh, a, a leaking platform would be pretty like touchy and uh, after everything that's gone on with WikiLeaks. But interestingly enough, uh, uh, back in September, um, I actually went with a number of projects to, uh, to Capitol Hill and met with uh, 
staffers of Congress people, persons, and senators, and they were all really excited about it because the argument is actually like the U.S. has all these laws in place that say you must provide a platform for certain kinds of whistleblowing. Like a, it's a legal requirement in many institutions, and the idea of being able to deploy a quickly quick and anonymous whistleblowing platform for a, specific, for a specific situation was actually very appealing. It was interesting. I, didn't, I thought there would be more concerns even about the name, but there weren't. Um, CryptoCat. CryptoCat is a web application that aims to um, provide a strongly, secure, a strongly secure, easily accessible chat client. Now, CryptoCat is something that's an example of a project that is um, has a lot of uh, concerns around in the privacy and security community about whether it can really effectively address the challenges it's trying to address. But what I think one of the things about the Open Technology Fund is, is that CryptoCat right now is one guy, it's one kid actually, who's developing this thing. He doesn't need that much money to help figure this out. The U.S. government generally gives grants of like half a million dollars, a million dollars more. He just needs a little bit of money to keep himself afloat while he tries and figures some of this stuff out and explore whether this is really possible. And it's interesting to me to see uh, a US funded initiative like the Open Technology Fund actually give money to, to really exploratory projects like this. Um, and there's a range of others. Uh, they fund Tor in part. They fund um, uh, a thing called the Guardian Project to empower citizen journalists around the world. Um, there's a slew of others. If you go to opentechfund.org, you can see all their projects. Some of them are really interesting. So that's one bigger part of what they do. We started 10 minutes late. Do we still? OK. I'm going to go on for another five minutes, but I want to have time for questions if you guys have questions. Um, but another thing we do is try and understand <clears throat> the world out there and understand the challenges, especially in more closed societies. Um, so earlier, I started off with an image from, from Burma. This is another image of Burma. This is actually also in the Information Ministry building, and this is the front desk, right? So I don't really know what they're trying to get at, but like, I, it was, it was an interesting thing to see, to like be introduced to the information ministry in this way. You walk in the door and look to your left and you have this thing fast, safe, and warm. Um, anyway, so uh, Radio Free Asia and the Open Technology Fund went to Burma in December 2012. We spent five days there. Um, it was folks like myself, um, folks like Jake Applebaum from the Tor Project, uh, the folks that run the Open Technology Fund, um, three members of the Broadcasting Board of Governors, so US diplomats. Uh, and then uh, some folks from Radio Free Asia. And our goal on this trip, oh, uh, our goal on this trip was to understand firsthand what it means to access communication and technology in Burma. Now, why are we doing this right now? Who, who here is maybe not terribly, terribly familiar with recent occurrences in Burma over the past few years? Okay, so Burma for many, many, I see some people raise their hand. Burma for many, many years since, I can't remember what, early 60s, late 60s, early 70s, um, has been ruled by a military dictatorship, essentially, a military junta. And they've been in an extremely oppressive society. Um, basically, from the 60s until just a few years ago, uh, there's a quote, there's a, a columnist, uh, Nicholas Kristof from the New York Times. He has visited Burma a number of times. And, uh, and he said that basically from like 1960-something to 2009, it's like a, it was a country stuck in a time capsule, really. Uh, there, there was all sorts of sanctions applied to them. Um, uh, they were a very, a very oppressive regime. Um, but sometime in the past couple of years, since 2000, end of 2011, I think, uh, they started opening up. And there's a lot of reasons why that might be. I don't want to take up time talking about it here, but just know that that's been happening. They held their first set of democratic elections that were not totally democratic. They held a second set of elections that were a bit more democratic. Um, they released long-term political dissidents from prison. Um, Aung San Suu Kyi is a famous activist that was uh, imprisoned under house arrest for 15 of the past 20 years. She's now an elected member of parliament. She's expected, I believe, to maybe be running for president in 2015. Um, the current president is still the former junta, uh, the former junta leader. Um, but things are changing there. They're opening themselves up to foreign investment. They're opening themselves up to foreign companies. And there's a lot of potential for Burma to really start to become a modern society that embraces more human rights, embraces access to the internet and, and communication technologies. But there's also a lot of hurdles. So um, Radio Free Asia, by the way, just by way of background, um, is not to be confused with groups like Radio Free Europe or Voice of America. They're not, they're not, they're not in Asian countries to spread an American message. They're, I think of them more as kind of NPR for Asia. 
where they trained independent journalists on the ground, which just happens to be funded by the US government. So they were operating in Burma for a long time, but now they can operate in the open there. And they were invited to come on an official visit to Burma, which is something that uh, the president of RFA told me. She's like, I never imagined this would even happen in my lifetime. I couldn't even imagine this happening. So she invited us along. And while they're going to do this diplomatic visit and meeting with people at all levels of government, we went to some of those meetings, but we also met with hackers on the ground and developers. We met with folks of the Ubuntu develop, developer community in Rangoon, uh, which is a recent, you know, recent development to have them there. Um, we tried to understand the state of technology access, the cost of technology access, the plans. There's a new law that's being debated right now that will be going to affect sometime this year that will open up telecommunication infrastructure to private investment from both domestic and foreign companies. So there's a lot going on there. And we got to spend five days on the ground meeting with people, exploring, traveling the country, um, and, and getting our own view of what happened. And we created a report. And you can download that report. It's free. It's open. If you go to opentechfund.org slash updates, or just click on the news, you'll see the, the link to it. And it kind of goes into our findings. Um, and what did we find? Well, we found a lot of things. And I, I'll leave the report to you guys for that. But, um, you know, some things like, you know, there, there were, uh, one story I tell a lot is so, like, we met, we met someone who um, was uh, in prison for four years. Um, he was actually sentenced to 20 years, but was released after four, for receiving an email with, I believe, a cartoon that was deemed to be offensive to the government. There's a law that was put on the books in 2005 that basically says you can't do that. You can't send or receive information uh, electronically with material offensive to the government. And this happened during the 2008 uh, Saffron Revolution, which is an uprising that happened in Burma. And he was a blogger at the time. And the government picked him up and coerced his, his email password out of him. Uh, whether or not he was tortured, I wasn't clear. His, his English wasn't, wasn't clear to me, so I don't want to say that without knowing for sure. But clearly, they got his password from him, found this, and sent him to prison. And so at the same time that we're putting, that, that they're debating this new law that's going to open up to all sorts of tech investment and make it much easier and much cheaper for people to access the internet in Burma, this law is still on the books. And maybe it's not being uh, used that much right now. Um, but that does not say that it won't be used in the future. And I think this represents a good example of the kind of uh, balance that Burma is striking right now between be going more progressive and holding on to potential for remaining oppressive uh, in the future. Um, there's a lot more I can say on that. I know we're getting later, but I, I just wanted to actually end by showing some photos from Burma because I think this is a really interesting trip. Um, and uh, oh, this is actually a, a, good, a good summary of actually what happened in Burma. So let me read this real quick. Uh, this is the summary of our report. The challenges currently facing uh, Myanmar's ICT, uh, Burma is officially called Myanmar by the Myanmar government, but there are many people that don't recognize that as a name, so many people use the word Burma. I don't know what the official US government stance is. For a long time it was Burma, I think now it's changing. Um, the challenges currently facing Myanmar's ICT industry are substantial, and it remains unclear whether the government of Myanmar is willing or able to address the country's telecommunication and media needs. The snapshot contained in this report exposes a country undecided, in which a precarious ICT framework holds both the legacy of autocratic conditions and yet also clear efforts to modernize and democratize. The international attention generated by Myanmar's recent political opening makes this an opportune moment for Myanmar to differentiate itself in the region and embrace its own positive, lasting change. Um, so yeah, so here's some photos. These are some developers in uh, Rangoon that we met up with. Um, this is our uh, guide, uh, Motu. Motsu works for, for um, Free Free Asia in Burma. This is his desk. He told me that he sleeps there most days of the week. He works really, really hard. I asked Motu um, if, he's excited, if he wants to travel outside of Burma at some point. And he said, yes. And I said, where do you want to go? He said, three places, my top three. He said, first, I want to go to Tibet, because I want to understand what's going on in terms of the oppression of the people in Tibet. I said, OK, cool. He said, second, I want to go to Cuba. Because I think it's really interesting that Cuba exists and, and the relationship between Cuba and the United States, and that that's, they're so close to each other, yet they have this relationship. I said, OK, great answer. And he said, third, I want to go to Afghanistan, because I really want to understand national security policy and how the government of Afghanistan is dealing with a terrorist threat in Afghanistan. I said, 
I thought, I mean, I, me being in India, I'm like, I thought you were going to say all sorts of other countries, but this, he's so motivated. And it was an amazing experience to spend five days with Motu, who's grown up in an oppressive country, is seeing that country open up, and is passionate to engage the world and understand uh, countries that have been in similar positions in all sorts of ways. I mean, Cuba, Tibet, and Afghanistan are all facing major challenges, maybe not the same as Burma, but certainly equally uh, uh, important. Um, this is a market that we went to in a place called Pianmana, which is outside of the capital of Burma. And we walked around this market and we met this really amazing family upstairs. And we were, we were doing this a lot, just interviewing people directly and asking them, you know, how do you access, you know, what's your communication technology that you use? Um, this family shares this cell phone. Uh, so smartphones are relatively recent introduction into Burma, but they already have like a really high penetration rate. So here we are in a really small town in the second floor of our market, and this is the smartphone that this woman's family shares together. Um, I don't know if they had a data plan on that phone, but they connect to Wi-Fi when they need data. And um, I think it shows, not that this is really a surprise to anyone, how rapidly uh, uh, telecommunications infrastructure can modernize and transform and become adopted by a population. I mean, it's really, it's really outstanding. Um, and this is the inside of a uh, uh, internet cafe in that same town. Um, so that was that was cool. Our colleague who actually works for RFA went there and was asking these guys questions about uh, about you know uh, about what the rules are for the internet cafe and was finding out things like they have to take a screenshot of the, of, the, of the computers every five seconds and all this other stuff that they have to do and they have to take IDs from people when they want to use the internet. And these guys are kind of like, why are you asking me these questions? And then somehow RFA came up and they're like, oh, you were for RFA? Oh, and they were like, we listen to RFA all the time. We really love it, da, da, da. And it like really opened up the conversation. He got to really understand uh, you know, a lot more about what they were doing. It was cool to be in like the middle of central Burma and talk about Radio Free Asia, which is not a fan of the, the military junta and see the excitement in people's eyes when they're like, oh, you work for them? That's so exciting. Um, so yeah. Okay, um, so, so I'm gonna wrap this up now. Um, why did I just tell you all of that? Why did I just tell you all these, all these stories? Um, like I said, in much of my academic career, I was not formally taught to examine the implications of my work at the world at large. Uh, we were focused on computer science. Um, but I learned through the work of a CS researcher, especially focusing on privacy and security, that a CS researcher can have a profound impact on the world. And not only that, but the question of impact is a scientific one in privacy and security research. And I think that the question of impact can even inform and allow us to, to generate better research and do better work uh, as computer science researchers. Um, and I think that us as researchers, us as computer scientists, uh, I'm not advocating everyone run out and go start working in like developing countries and do that. But what I'm saying is keeping our eyes open to the direct implications of our work can translate to even more meaningful contributions to the world. It can translate to more meaningful research and it can affect change in a profound way. Um, I really think that it's, we're at a special time right now where the value of technologists and computer scientists and the role of changing our society is being recognized to higher and higher degrees. I mean, all the things that I talked about today are not things that were going on a few years ago. Like there was no technology at the Federal Trade Commission. Second Muse didn't exist. There were none of these global hacking initiatives. Um, there was no open tech fund run by an organization uh, specifically looking at opening up free speech through the internet in oppressive societies. I mean, this is new stuff and the value there is being recognized. And I hope that whether you decide to go into that space or not, that, that we can elevate the level of maybe social consciousness within the computer science discipline, even when we're focused on the very specific technical problems that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that's what I have. Questions? Sure. No questions. Yes. Sure. Um, so just to be clear, I don't I don't work for Radio Free Asia. I'm a I'm a volunteer on the advisory board. Just to just just make sure that's on the record. <laughs> um, so oh uh, so the question was how did I get my job at FTC and Radio Free Asia? And I'll, I guess I'll throw in second news in there as well. Um, so I started at the FTC. That was the first thing I did of everything that we did here. Um, I learned about what the FTC was doing by getting involved in privacy and security research. When I started a grad school, remember, I was a computer vision researcher. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what I wanted to research when I realized that wasn't it for me. I found privacy and security, and it excited me. 
It excited me because of the potential impact it could have. And it was through going to conferences and just talking to people that I started realizing the other interesting work that was going on in that space. Um, uh, so this, this story is kind of funny and it's worth saying, which is that I was like at the second privacy enhancing technologies conference that I ever went to, if people are familiar with the PETS conference, uh, I was walking to dinner with a colleague of mine, Chris Sugoyan, and I overheard him talking about his work at the FTC. And I said offhand to him, man, that sounds really interesting. I'd love to do something like that. And he says to me, he goes, would you? Because we're hiring. <laughs> and before I left Europe, I had a phone interview with the FTC about a job there. Which, when I came back and told people that, they said like, oh, you're just lucky Mike Brennan, like getting a job offer at, at a conference saying it mentioned. I said, no, it's not, it's not luck. It's not that at all. It's about going to these to the conferences, about doing your work, showing that you're, you are, you care about these issues and you're passionate about the work that you're doing. Even, like, in that case, I was doing all this authorship recognition research. It had nothing to do with national privacy regulation. But I was engaging in the conversation. I was investing myself in the community. And I was meeting the people that are involved there. And it's through that, that, that that opportunity came about. And then on the other side of it, the interesting thing is it's really hard to find people that want to do that, right? Like, pe like people, one, I think the main thing is people didn't know that that's really a job option that was out there because it wasn't for a very long time. Um, but two, Chris was excited that I was interested because most people, go, oh yeah, you know, that's that's cool, Chris, that you do that. And I think Pam and I, he and I both had some similar problems, which is like, uh, or challenges, which is that sometimes the folks in computer science in our departments and our schools are like, you want to do what? Oh, you're just doing something on the side. That's weird. Um, and then as you do it and you show them what you're doing, you start affecting change in the university and the departments and they start embracing other avenues of impact in computer science. Um, so how did I get that job at the FTC? I, I think by investing myself in a research community, the privacy and research community, and um, Chris, if you know Chris, is a much more outspoken person than I am. So how he got the job, he got the job by being Chris Sagoyan. Um, <laughs> but then you meet the Chris Sagoyans and you express the interest out there and, th and then that comes up. Um, second use is a, a similar thing, the work I do now. I saw Random Acts of Kindness as an initiative and I said, that's really cool. You have all these people around the world that are applying their development skills to social problems in their community. That's amazing. I want to run an event like that in Philadelphia. So on my free time, on my own, I just did that. I wasn't doing it to try and get a job, but I did it because I really cared about it and I put my heart into it. And I ran two events that were really successful, and we saw a lot of really positive impact coming out of it. And the folks at Second Muse came to me and said, your events were really successful. You saw, we saw a lot of positive impact out of it. We want to replicate that more around the world. Can you help us do that? And I started working with them part time, and it worked out really well, and then I ended up getting a job. Um, and then Radio Free Asia, getting on that advisory board is a similar thing. It's like I was actually working at the FTC and meeting people in DC. And I met this great guy named Dan Meredith who worked at New America Foundation and then worked uh, as a technologist at Al Jazeera for a while. And then he came back to the US to direct his Open Technology Fund. And we had had lots of conversations about the value of impact in computer science. And he said, look, I want to do this. I want to, I have, it's, we are going to be giving grants. That's what it's going to be doing. But it's going to be more than that. I want to do something more interesting than that. I want to do it more effectively. I want to be able to give the exciting projects that I see as exciting projects and really exploratory projects some funding while also embracing you know, the big established projects. And um, I don't, you know, one problem I think, maybe Ian can speak to this about Tor, I think that a lot of projects, it's like you start developing a great tool and then people only want to fund the new exciting feature and they don't want to fund all the maintenance and work that goes into keeping that tool effective and going. And Dan has, had seen this for a long time and he said, I want to do both. I want to make sure that we're actually funding the, the boring stuff and the exciting stuff. And we had conversations about that. So when the opportunity came around, um, he reached out to me. I really think that it's about, if, if you're interested in finding a way to social impact through computer science, um, it, it's about having those conversations with people and making it known, which is kind of a scary thing to do because I talked about that to many different professors throughout my graduate career until I met Rachel Greenstadt, my advisor, and I would tell them, and they would look at me like I'm crazy. I'd be like, no, 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 no. I want to like travel and do some really like impactful stuff in these specific sectors. And they'd be like, what? What are you talking about? Um, and then I met Rachel Greenstadt, who's my advisor, and she said, you do? That's great. Check out privacy and security. Here's all these conferences. Da, 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 da. And um, you know, you got to be open about it. You got to be a little, don't, don't be, you know, be open about what you want to achieve and where you want to go and let those conversations happen and meet those people and you'll get into that community. And I think that's how, 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 you, how you get there. That's been my experience. I hope that that's not always the way it's going to happen in the future. I hope that 
it will be a clear and obvious path in the future where a computer scientist can say, I want to apply my skills in this way rather than this way. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, let's thank Mike. All right.